My name is Jorge Ferrer. I'm a clinical psychologist, an educator, a relationship counselor, and the author of uh, several books uh, on transpersonal psychology, on integral education, and on intimate relationships. I was also on the faculty of the California Institute of Integral Studies for uh, 20 years, where I also serve as the chair of the Department of East-West Psychology, a department concerned with the interface of Western psychology and the wisdom of contemplative and indigenous traditions of the world, a department concerned with the interface of psychology and spirituality and its applications in the modern world. I'm also on the faculty uh, of several psychotherapy trainings, uh, I train transpersonal psychotherapists, that is to say, psychotherapists who are interested uh, in a holistic approach uh, to healing and that are open into the spiritual dimension uh, of psychotherapy and healing. And also I'm teaching in a training uh, of psychotherapists who are uh, training for uh, an integrative approach to sexuality and sexual healing. Because of my interest uh, in this holistic views of the person and my interest in the interface of psychology and spirituality, uh, all those uh, personal interests and professional interests uh, took me to the study of different religious and spiritual traditions. Uh, I spent about 15 years uh, studying Buddhism and practicing Buddhist meditation uh, of different kinds. Uh, I also spent about 14 years going to South America, uh, to Mexico, but in particular to Peru, to the Amazonian jungle, uh, to the sacred valley of Peru, to study with different healers, different uh, shamans, uh, and different plant medicines. All this gave me like a more uh, kind of holistic uh, perspective of what it works and what doesn't work when we approach holistic healing in individuals, because each tradition, it's a the spiritual or healing tradition, they give you like different tools. Uh, some traditions like uh, offer you uh, more and deeper understanding of the working of the mind, uh, of how to identify neurotic loops, how to move into contemplative awareness, while other traditions give you a deeper understanding of the working of the body and the life energy, uh, like many shamanic traditions, also in connection to the to the to nature and nat natural dynamics. So in my work, uh, I always seek to integrate to integrate uh, the wisdom and the knowledge I have learned from Western psychology, uh, from the Eastern and Western mystical traditions of the North, so to speak, and also from the indigenous and shamanic traditions of the South. Welcome to this masterclass. This is a masterclass about my course, Love and Freedom the art of sensual spirituality. And in this masterclass, we're gonna be discussing uh, the contents and, uh, of this class, the objectives and uh, some of the uh, main insights and practical understandings that you will gain by taking this class. In doing so, my hope uh, is that you have like a full informed sense of what this course is about and you can make a full informed decision about taking the class. For most people I know, modern life is full of stress. And one of the assumptions uh, in this course is that part of this stress is caused by the very mental way we have learned to approach life and our problems. Even from day one, uh, we have been taught that in order to solve our problems in life, wherever they are professional or creative or personal or interpersonal or even intimate, we need just to think harder and deeper. This is what happens uh, when we go to school from kindergarten. Kindergarten was a pretty holistic school, so to speak. We not only study numbers and words, we also dance and we laugh and we play. And in those ways, we also increase our emotional intelligence, not only our cognitive intelligence. All this uh, um, support for the different intelligences that we all have as human beings, emotional, somatic, instinctive, uh, mental, intuitive, and so forth, normally comes to a stop when we start going to a school and it gets worse when we go to higher education and to university. Uh, during that process, education becomes more and more mind-centered. The outcome of this uh, situation is that most human beings, at least in the modern West and probably beyond, uh, we reach adulthood 
being uh, pretty much mature in a mental, rational way, but with another of our, all of our different other walls, like our body, our instinct, and our hearts, and so forth, in different developmental stages. They are not all a part with our minds. They cannot sit in the same table as equals with our minds to co-create our personal life. So one of the things that we're gonna be learning in this class is to really open ourselves to invite all of those different ways of knowing, all those different forms of intelligence to the same table with our minds so that we can start co-creating a life that is more fulfilling and is also even more open to the spiritual sense of life in your body and in your everyday life. Because whenever when we start inviting all these different parts of ourselves, something happens. And uh, what happens is that whenever, for example, we start uh, inviting and connecting with uh, our own vital world, vital energy, our own sexuality as well, as life energy, as that kind of creative energy of life that from life, from nature, from the cosmos, from reality, uh, comes through us to create, to help us individuate, to help us to become uh, the unique embodiment of life and the mystery that each of you are, then uh, immediately our minds start also connecting with something greater than itself, something that is transcendent, something that is sacred, not only because it's transcendent, but also because it's intimately connected to the origin of life. And when the mind starts to connect, to feel directly all those other different ways of knowing and intelligences within the body, within the home of the mind, then the, the mind almost naturally starts relaxing. Why? Because it starts to feel supported, uh, start realizing that she's not by herself. The mind is not by herself, always like trying to think all the solutions by herself. There is a body that is with its own uh, somatic intelligence. There is the vital world with the instinctive wisdom of life. There is uh, the heart with its own intuitive knowing. And then the mind realizes, I'm not by myself. I don't need to take all the decisions by myself. And thanks to that insight, the mind can also become more porous, more permeable to also higher forms of intelligence, higher forms of intelligence that might exist transcending the human being, perhaps in fields of consciousness, perhaps in subtle realms of this multidimensional cosmos, perhaps sources of wisdom that exist as well in nature and life as we know it. And when the mind uh, starts to even get a glimpse of those higher forms of consciousness, higher forms of intelligence uh, in the cosmos, in life, beyond ourselves, uh, something else happens that uh, brings even a sense of uh, deeper peace to the mind. Because the mind realizes then directly that it does not need to know everything. This is what is called mental pride. The pride of the mind, like the sense of the mind that is the only part of ourselves that knows or knows better. And uh, in this course, we're going to give you like practical tools, uh, practical understandings, uh, so that uh, you can also cultivate this mental humility so that the mind can become more porous, not only to those kind of uh, inner resources within you of wisdom, but also other resources that might exist beyond ourselves. It is this combination, it is this interaction between the life energy and the energy of consciousness, uh, between that kind of immanent dimension of the mystery, that dimension of the mystery that exists within matter, within nature, within the body, and that other dimension of the mystery, the creative mystery that might exist beyond ourselves, beyond this uh, world of form, and color and sound uh, in different, perhaps, subtle realms of reality. It is this interaction of those two energies that in this class we are going to be playing with so that uh, we not only developed spiritually from our hearts up, uh, what I call a heart ch chakra up spirituality, but our spirituality is more holistic, is more embodied, 
some spirituality that embraces all of who we are, our bodies, our instincts, our hearts, our minds, and our consciousness. This is a fully holistic and embodied spirituality. And this is the spirituality that is especially important in our times, because otherwise, the other types of spirituality that perhaps were valid in their own historical times and contexts, today we have seen that lead to problems. On the one hand, they lead to individual problems, like problems of dissociation, tensions between different parts of the person, persons whose spiritual ideals are in tension with their sexual desires, for example, uh, tension and dissociations of different types, or for example, forms of spirituality that are not as alive and uh, uh, fulfilling as they could be. I remember when I was teach, uh, studying Buddhism uh, for many, many years, and um, I really respect it, and I'm still extremely grateful to us, those spiritual friends and mentors I had during my Buddhist studies. And at the same time, there was a way in which uh, sometimes I found with many of my teachers that they were living in a state of chronic equanimity, so to speak, uh, uh, in, from my perspective, and you need to understand that I was born in Barcelona, I was born in the Mediterranean, I'm a very passionate man, I'm a Scorpio. So from that perspective, I felt, I love these teachers, they have so much to teach me, but they lack passion, they lack aliveness, the life lasts for life. And this is part of when I went to the South, to really like, kind of reintegrate uh, both polarities of spiritual resources, the ones from consciousness, from light, from inner peace, and the one that is like about creative life, manifesting life, and I believe like a fully embodied, fully integral spirituality needs to integrate both sources of energy, of spiritual energy at all levels of the person, in our bodies, in our instincts, in our hearts, and in our minds. And this is very important for our times, not only for this uh, kind of uh, a more um, less dissociated and more holistic personal spiritual lives, but also to avoid many of the problems that we see over and over again in the news. For example, uh, I don't know you, but at this point I almost get bored when I hear about another sexual scandal carried uh, out by one or another spiritual teacher or shaman or, or Tibetan Lama or, or Hindu uh, lumin luminary, spiritual luminary. Um, what's going on? What's going on when we see all these amazing, awakened individuals who have been like recognized sometimes by their own traditions as wise elders. What's going on when these wise elders who have been teaching about spirituality and love for decades, um, they, we learn that they have been um, harassing sexually their students or abusing children or being authoritarian in very problematic ways. What's going on really? And uh, my answer here is that it's not a fully holistic spirituality. It's a spirituality that is from the heart chakra up. They have developed compassion, equanimity. They have developed states of consciousness. They have developed psychic healing. They have developed many amazing psychic and contemplative abilities. But many of these teachers, and I have been hanging out with some of them, you put them around three or four young female students and they become adolescents. They become children. They don't know what to do. They become ungrounded. They are nervous. And from those places, uh, uh, normally like problems and sometimes tragedies follow up. I would like to uh, share with you a bit of my personal history uh, behind uh, my passion for this integration of sexuality, sensuality, and spirituality. There are parts of this history that I feel vulnerable to share with you, to share in public, but uh, I think it's important today that we self-disclose as much as possible in a community of peers uh, so that we can learn from each other. Because as I mentioned and I emphasize in the course over and over again, we're all teachers and students. We have always something to learn from each other. What I would like to share is that like uh, in my adolescence and my young adulthood, uh, I feel for many years, uh, sexually blocked. 
I had a lot of fears. Uh, I couldn't uh, be in sexual relationships uh, because I would freeze. Uh, it wasn't because I had experienced any sexual trauma. It wasn't because there was nothing bad happened to me on a sexual level at home or anything like that. Many years later, a very wise mentor and a psychotherapist and sexologist uh, told me, well, what happened to you is that you have a lot of sexual energy and then you needed to build uh, some physical, emotional and psychological structures to channel all that energy in a constructive way. That resonated very deeply with me because my concern, and that's why I would get frozen at, at, at that time, is that if I would let myself go, something bad would happen. Maybe I would hurt the other person. Maybe I would hurt myself. Something bad would happen, even though I wouldn't know what it was. So I was still in the process of uh, uh, healing my blockages when I started uh, uh, delving into spirituality and I was st starting to study uh, Buddhism. In this case, it was uh, Korean Buddhism in Barcelona. And uh, at that point, it was very clear for me that I needed to do some sexual healing. My spiritual teacher kind of... Uh, Kind of really appreciated me. I was very disciplined. I was uh, getting up very early every morning at 5.30 a.m. to do a lot of spiritual practice. So she told me, like, Jorge, I think you are a very, like, devoted student. I would love, I, I invite you to uh, move into our monastery here in Barcelona, into our meditation center, and, uh, and like, to deepen your practice. That was quite an honor. Uh, not everybody got invited uh, to move in the, in the meditation center. But then she told me, but uh, I'm going to do an energy, energetic reading of you to give you some advice. So she put me lying down and she did some energetic reading of myself. And then what is what she told me? She told me, you know, yes, you need to move here. But in order to move here, like everybody else, you'll have to spend the next three years in a strict celibacy. <laughs> That didn't ring a bell. I was very aware of my sexual blockages. And that was this spiritual teacher telling me that what I needed to do was not explore my sensuality or sexuality to heal, but to spend three more years uh, without touching that dimension of myself. That was the beginning of my spiritual individuation. That was the beginning of my trust in my inner spiritual authority. That was the beginning of my saying goodbye to this teacher and exploring many other approaches. Interestingly enough, um, many years later, when I was like in my early 30s, I had like a call to go into Saliva but it was a call from my own energy after, I ha after I've had healed my sexuality, after I've had many really beautiful sexual relationships that opened me to spiritual realms. And then at some point, I felt this calling from my energy to, uh, inward. And I didn't know for how long it was going to go. It lasted almost three years. During those three years, I didn't have any sexual experience, either with other people or with myself. They were some of the most erotic years of my life. Uh, my whole body recovered what Freud called the polymorphous sensuality of the baby. Uh, I call this like a, some kind of like a, a post-genital puberty in the sense that uh, during those three years, all those energies were kind of like, like in the period of latency before uh, puberty. They were kind of like getting dormant and then they were still into waking up, but waking up again in the whole body, not only in the pelvic and genital area, as it happens in ordinary adolescents. So these are some of the pieces that uh, start making for me this connection between the, the spirituality and sexuality and sensuality. And I also, of course, got in touch with many uh, mentors and uh, seasoned practitioners that they were working in that integration and I did a lot of work with them. As I kind of uh, start to explore uh, deeply my own spirituality through different practices, I realized that both energies were intertwined. That whenever I would go into my most highest, uh, more sublime, more subtle uh, states of consciousness or mystical states, uh, I would always feel like the sense of the erotic or the static emerging like many mystics have reported uh, in the past, uh, historically. And also the same would happen in sexuality. Whenever I felt finally 
free from this kind of like genital sexuality that our culture uh, teaches us that is the normal way to have sex. And uh, I had my own sexual energies like spreading through my body and uh, each sexual encounter or not all of them perhaps, but many of my sexual encounters would open myself into a sense of transcendence, into a sense of the sacred. Sometimes I would feel after a sexual encounter, I would find myself in what I could only describe as an embodied heaven. What can one do to increase uh, this connection to uh, sensuality and sexuality as life energy? Uh, many things, and of course, there is not like a single answer for everybody. But uh, generally speaking, uh, what I would advise is uh, two things. On the one hand, uh, go to nature as much as possible. Especially uh, go to nature, uh, connecting to nature in a sensuous way. Nature uh, offers us this organic reference of integration. Uh, nature is luscious, it's sensuous, it's also emotional with its flowers. It's also kind of has an intelligence to it, a tremendous wisdom. So therefore functions as a resonant mirror within ourselves. Uh, the more, especially if you live in big cities, if you live without not too much contact to nature, I encourage you at least maybe in the weekend, once a week, to go for long walks in nature and walks in nature that are sensuous. You are not just looking and and uh, thinking in your head about your next day, you really ground yourself in the body, you take some deep breaths to become as fully aware of your body as possible. And then with that greater awareness in your body, you start your walk. And this is a walk in which you not only walk and look, but it's a walk that you touch a walk that you touch the different leaves, the different surfaces, the soil. It's a walk in which you can also smell the different flowers and the different leaves and the ground and touch. And if you, even if you are like brave enough, you can even use your sense of taste with carefulness, of course, but uh, uh, using your sense of taste to taste like the different flavors of nature. This uh, simple sensuous walk in nature, uh, I'm sure if you do it, uh, you will agree with me. Once you come back home, once you come back to the city, you are going to feel very different. You're going to feel much more in your body. You're going to feel your uh, uh, life energy flowing within yourself in different ways. And if from that place, you open yourself to a sexual experience, that sexual experience will be so much more connected to that life energy that you have probably ever experienced before. One of the assumptions of this course is that uh, most of us we live in our modern times and uh, a life that is not that embodied. And of course, uh, modern technology doesn't help. We spend our time, uh, now our free time, not going to nature and breathing fresh air, but looking out at the screens of our cell phones or computers. All activities that uh, help us to be more disembodied and more in our heads. And uh, as mentioned before, like uh, modern education is very cognizantric. Uh, it also teaches us like to function from a very mental space. So um, this is one of the assumptions of this class that is corroborated by some modern research. A number of years ago, like some uh, researchers, cognitive uh, psychologists in the United States carry out this very interesting research. They gave like a number of uh, uh, subjects uh, in the experiment, uh, this kind of uh, uh, clock uh, with a beeper. And then uh, throughout the day, uh, there will be like some random device that they would uh, make that beeper sound uh, in the most unexpected moments of the day. The, every single time that that beep could sound, uh, the person who would hear the beep would need to report where was the main experience of themselves in that moment. Uh, were they experiencing their bodies? Were they experiencing their feet? Were they experiencing their belly? Were they experiencing their hearts? Were they experiencing their heads? Guess what? An overwhelming amount of people who participated in this experiment uh, consistently reported that almost every single time the beep sounded, uh, they were stuck in their heads, thinking about what to do next, preoccupied by something they did in the past, trying to solve any problem, thinking hard about one or other thing. I believe uh, the title of the research was appropriately called 
the absent body. I would like to share this story with you today, emerging from my own clinical practice, that illustrates uh, the importance and the power of being connected to uh, our own vitality as a source of life, a topic that we'll be exploring in this course uh, in detail. This was like a middle-aged woman uh, in their mid-40s who had been married with her husband, who still deeply loved for about 18 years. She came uh, to do individual uh, sessions with me, not with the husband, it was in the couple psychotherapy. And uh, her complaint or the things she wanted to explore was the following. She would tell me, Jorge, I really love my husband. Our sexuality is bankrupt. Uh, we don't have sex almost ever. And uh, I don't feel desire towards my husband anymore. And I still want to be with him. And I find myself fantasizing about cheating. I find myself entering social media and I start flirting with ex-boyfriends, with people I have met in the street. My husband already has caught me a couple of times and things are not going well. Can you please help? Interestingly, uh, this client of mine uh, who was living in Central Europe uh, was approaching me because uh, she knew that uh, in my clinical practice I have helped many couples to also explore different uh, alternative styles of relationship from monogamy to consensual non-monogamy and to many other possibilities. So I believe that at the beginning she was curious, she was like interested, like can this uh, counselor help me to open my marriage so that I can be happily at home with my husband and I can achieve like sexual passion and uh, transcendence outside the home. As we start exploring her life situation, uh, it became very clear to me that she was a very passionate woman who had somehow lost contact with her own sources of inner vitality uh, in a life basically being a housewife at home and also doing a very intellectual work uh, professionally outside home. So for me, before I start exploring even the possibility of opening the relationship, what I told her was like, I believe you need to reconnect with your wild woman. You need to reconnect with that wild energy in yourself. You need to learn how to channel, to tap into and channel all that passion that you have that is taking you in all these sexual fantasies, all these scenarios of uh, having passionate sex with strangers. You need to re-own that energy to uh, animate your life, everyday life, to animate your body. So we start like doing a program of practices. Some of these practices you will find in the InfiJoy course, uh, practices of, of self-love, uh, of uh, sensuality, self-sensuality, practices of reconnecting to nature, and also practices of practicing trans-orgasmic sex with her partner. Through all those practices, uh, along several weeks and even months of therapy, something striking started to happen. My client stopped having fantasies of having sex with other men, stopped having all these filtrations relationship uh, through social media, I started feeling more alive and more connected to her husband. Uh, and uh, both of them, they bought uh, a little cottage in nature so that she could also connect with her wild woman through more contact to nature. And uh, as far as I know, these days, they still live happily together. If anything of what you have uh, heard in this master class uh, resonates uh, with you and your moment, uh, relational moment, personal moment, spiritual moment, if anything that I have said have struck a chord within yourself, uh, I invite you, I encourage you, I even urge you to consider signing for this course with me, Love and Freedom. I would be so very happy to accompany you in your path, personal, spiritual, sensuous, and relational.